the Weather Channel, WGBH with some great educational content, ABC News. We gaan u nu een band laten zien van de SeaWorld conferentie met de keynote speech van Steve Jobs. Hij is de baas van Apple. Hij noemt zichzelf nog uh, steeds tijdelijk. Hij was natuurlijk de oprichter, samen met Steve Wozniak van Apple. Maar hij is weer terug als baas. Ze zoeken nog naar een nieuwe leider, maar Steve Jobs doet het heel goed. We laten u bijna een uur zien van zijn toespraak. Dat is heel lang en sommige mensen zullen zeggen dat is toch wel erg commercieel. Dat is ook zo. Het is natuurlijk een toespraak op een conferentie voor gelovigen, voor Apple dealers, voor Apple gebruikers. Die de nieuwste snufjes willen horen van de grote man zelf. Steve Jobs. Maar aan de andere kant, het is een heel interessant verhaal. Het geeft een goede indruk van wat Apple eigenlijk wil. Waar de, wat de stand van zaken is. En aan het eind geven we wat commentaar. Maar een unieke gelegenheid om een van de grote mensen van de computerindustrie even in actie te zien. Steve Jobs. We have some really fun stuff to share with you today. And uh, so let me go ahead and get started. First, I'd like to give you just a, a brief update on Apple, uh, the corporation. Uh, just a few slides, and then we'll get into the fun stuff in a row. We uh, recently announced our profits for our last fiscal quarter, uh, ending in June. And uh, it was our seventh profitable quarter in a row. Uh, so Apple's doing pretty well there. <laughs> In addition to that, uh, Apple now has over $3 billion in cash with very little debt. So the company's very healthy. Now, one of the things that we think is really important is to bring operational excellence back to Apple because in our industry, only the efficient survive. And one of the best ways to measure that is how many days of inventory you have leaving each quarter. And as you can see, we've been working that tighter and tighter and tighter every quarter. And last quarter, we ended with less than one day of inventory, about 15 hours to be precise. And that's pretty remarkable, especially when you take a look at that relative to our competition. Compaq ended with 28 days. Gateway and Dell, the two direct players, with nine and six. As a matter of fact, we've beat Dell now for the last four or five quarters. And Apple ended with 15 hours. And of course, inventory is you know, something in our industry that gets stale pretty fast. And lastly, we added a new board member to our board of directors, Mickey Drexler, the CEO of Gap Inc., a brilliant, brilliant uh, executive and marketeer has joined our board. And I think he's going to help us a lot going forward. So those are just a few things to give you an update on, on sort of the overall corporate stuff. Now let's delve into the really fun stuff. First thing I'd like to do is give you a little overview of where we are with QuickTime. I know a lot of you are very familiar with this. Um, QuickTime is an incredibly important strategic technology and set of initiatives for Apple. We're really serious about digital media. Apple invented this stuff a long time ago. And we're really seeing some incredible success with the new versions of QuickTime. Now, we are still, we thought we were finished with it, but it keeps going. The largest internet event in history has been the downloading of the Star Wars 1 episode trailer. And as of last weekend, there have been over 25 million downloads of this trailer. Now, we've offered this in several sizes. Most everybody goes for the big one, because they want the quality. And that means that we have downloaded over 450 terabytes of data from our websites to viewers around the world on this, the largest internet event in history. We also just recently introduced QuickTime 4. Now, QuickTime 4 is the latest incarnation of QuickTime. It features a ton of new codecs and other great technology. But the biggest thing it features is, of course, live internet streaming. So that you can download stuff, but you, don't, you can also stream stuff live. And it's been, it's been huge. Uh, since we put this on the web, there have been 13 million downloads of QuickTime 4 to date, uh, skyrocketing past all of our estimates. And we're incredibly pleased with this. We've also introduced QuickTime TV. Now, if you look at video on the internet, 
it's not so good in general. Uh, it's, 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 the quality is very poor, and the delivery consistency is very poor. We aim to change that with QuickTime TV. And so what is that all about? How do we go about that? Well, we should look at, we should look at regular television and see what are the key components to making this work. The first is a great television receiver. Then you need television stations. Then you need a broadcast network because television stations are usually local. They can't broadcast around the, the continent or, or around the world. And of course, you need content. So let's look at where we stand on QuickTime TV in each of these four areas. Television receiver, well, that one's easy. We've got the best one in the world, QuickTime 4, the highest quality video on the internet. What do we do about a television station? <clears throat> to broadcast content right now, all of our competitors require that you go to them and pay them a lot of money for fancy server software to run on your server. We call it a server tax. Now, yeah, they give away a few baby copies, but if you want to do anything serious, you've got to go write them a big check, and all the content providers out there know that. What is a television station for QuickTime TV? It is any server running the new open protocols for streaming on the Internet, RTP and RTSP, the new industry standards, and anyone who implements those and runs a server using them can be a television station on QuickTime TV. We are not interested in making any money taxing server software. So anyone can do this. And as a matter of fact, we've written one that conforms to the standard called the QuickTime Streaming Server. Server. We give it away free with Mac OS X, and we also give the source code away. And it's now running on Linux, and it's running on NT, and there's more to follow very shortly. So in this Darwin open source streaming server program that we have to give away the source code, there have been over 37,000 downloads of this Darwin open source streaming server. So there's a tremendous amount of activity because people are tired of paying server taxes to broadcast uh, on the internet. So that's a television station. What about the broadcast network? Well, that's obviously the internet. But it's not so obvious, actually, because it turns out if you're in New York and the server's here, there's a lot of traffic between New York and here on the internet. And the internet does not guarantee latency does not guarantee delivery in any period of time. And so it's very likely that your video is going to be of very poor quality. Now, what can we do about that? Well, to get around that problem, we have partnered with a company called Akamai. We've made a substantial investment in them as well. And what Akamai does is they put servers all around the internet, all around the world. And they have almost a 1,000 of them now around the world. And these servers actually intercept you when you're looking for something, direct you to the server nearest you, and broadcast the content from that server. Now, they weren't doing streaming until we came along and started working with them. And together, we're bringing QuickTime streaming services up on every single one of their servers. So that when you go to look at something in New York, you're going to be vectored to a server dynamically. You know nothing about this that's very close to you, and you're going to get dynamite content all around the world over almost 1,000 servers today. And what about content? We've got some dynamite content in QuickTime TV. Uh, we've got some tremendous players and a you know, few new ones almost weekly. We've got BBC World News, Bloomberg Television, Fox News. These are all broadcasting 24 by 7, by the way. Fox Sports, HBO, NPR, The Weather Channel, WGBH with some great educational content, ABC News one of the most respected news sources in the world, ESPN for sports, Rolling Stone has got great music videos on, VH1, Disney, tremendous content from Disney, and then two new ones today, Rhino Records and Warner Brother Records, broadcasting on QuickTime TV. Some of these folks are only streaming in the QuickTime format. So what I would love to do now is show you some of this stuff because we've really gotten it together with the television receiver, the station, the network, and the content. And we think QuickTime TV is going to be very, very important. So what I'd love to do now is invite Phil Schiller, our Vice President of Worldwide Product Marketing out here, give us a demonstration of QuickTime TV. Phil? Hi, Steve. Thank you. Uh, QuickTime Force is doing incredibly well. We've seen so much response from customers to seeing the best content on the internet. 
Uh, let me start with, with the thing that really kicked it off, as Steve said. I'm sure many of you have watched the Star Wars trailer done exclusively in quick time. If some of you out there aren't in the 25 million or so people have watched it, I'm going to give you a brief glimpse of it. You can see the quality that no one else has ever delivered with content of video over the internet. not condone a course of action that will lead us to war. A communications disruption can mean only one thing, invasion. The quality is just phenomenal. If you haven't seen it, you can still go download it, add up to those 25 million users, and see video that nothing else delivers. Now, there's a lot that's been going on out there, and people have been doing things all by themselves and we're just finding amazing content on the web. For example, I'm going to click on a link now that goes out to someone else's website. It's Weird Al Yankovic, the musician. Yep, and he's done his own QuickTime movie, and he's streaming it right now from his web server. Turning on the traffic to his web server. Try one more time. If anyone knows Weird Al right now, <laughs> we'll try one last time. There we go. Oh my, my, this here Anakin guy. Maybe Vader someday later, now he's just a small fry. He left his home and kissed his mommy goodbye, saying soon I'm gonna be a Jedi. I'm going to be a Jedi Did you know this junkyard slave It's not time to watch the whole thing, but that's coming, yep. It's coming right from Weird Al's site, over the internet, nothing local here. Now, as Steve mentioned, we've got a lot of great content. There's a lot of great content out there, and with QuickTime TV, you don't have to scour the internet to find all of it. We build in channels right into the QuickTime player, and all the user has to do is click a button and start watching great content. So, for example, BBC. This is coming from London, live news, 24 hours a day, playing up on the Internet. Now, again, it is live news. I have no idea what they're broadcasting right now, so we'll just watch and see. Mohammed will now be seen as having made the right choices. I think much depends on the measures that Malaysia has taken to rebuild its economy whilst the doors were effectively shut on the outside world. Uh, it's actually taken some pretty drastic measures, for example, to streamline the banking sector. So that's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, live news with people like BBC and Bloomberg Financial broadcasting over the QuickTime TV network. Or perhaps I want to go and check people like Fox or ABC doing some very exciting things with both Fox and ABC. We're using interactive features of QuickTime, taking technology from Macromedia's Flash, interactive animation, and streaming that. This is streaming animation right inside the video channel that allows us to have interactivity. We can get video and news on demand. For example, nope, we can check out the Clintons on vacation. It looks like a campaign, and it sounds like a campaign. I've been from one end of the state to the other, and I'm going to be back many times. Cool. Now, maybe you're not into politics. Some of us aren't. Some of us are more into sports. So, for example, with Fox, we now have a sports channel up there. Again, we've got interactive flash content streaming down a front end, allows us dyna dynamically pick what kind of video we want to watch. I'm an East Coaster, so I'm curious about Vinny Testaverde and the New York Jets. Vinny Testaverde enters the 1999 season with a lot to prove. So what else is new? That's been the drill for Vinny ever since he won the Heisman Trophy and was picked first overall in the 87 draft. The rap was always the same. Too many interceptions, 
too few touchdowns. But that came to a sudden halt last season when... So cool, you can watch news, you can watch sports, it's great educational content with WGBH. And as Steve mentioned, we've got a lot of new content coming out with music providers like Rhino Records and Warner. Now this is just coming up today. I'm going to take a little risk here and try a brand new channel out just starting this morning. Warner Records. Live, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, music video channel. And there's a prompt right there on the bottom. Right on the bottom, there's a button that says buy now. I click that, it launches my web browser, takes me right to a page to buy the CD I'm watching on the video channel. Something you can't do on TV. And last, let me end with one of my favorites. My kids really love the Disney Channel. I live in an area of the California where we don't get Disney radio. Here, I can now go into the Disney Channel and listen to Disney radio anywhere in the world broadcasting over the QuickTime TV network. Or perhaps I want to watch a new movie trailer. Hey, here's an interesting one, Toy Story 2. <laughs> Let's watch that trailer. I'll bet it's good. streaming over the internet, over the new QuickTime TV. Thanks a lot. Boy, that looks like it's going to be a good movie, huh? <laughs> so, QuickTime. There's a lot going on in QuickTime, and if you're not publishing in QuickTime, we suggest you take another look at it, because it's just taken off, and the quality is the highest video and audio on the internet. So next, I'd like to give you a preview of Macintosh OS 9. The next major release of the Macintosh operating system is coming out in October, and it's a biggie. There's over 50 new features in it. And the theme of OS 9 is we want OS 9 to be our internet co-pilot. We want it to do a lot of things for us to really take us places on the internet further and faster than we've ever been and protect us at the same time. So I'm going to show you, since it's OS 9, nine internet power features today, and just go through them one by one, and then we'll show you a few of them. The first one, and maybe the most startling, is, is Sherlock 2. We introduced Sherlock in the last major release of the Mac OS last fall, Mac at 8.5. And it was an immediate hit. What Sherlock let you do was it lets you type in natural language commands, like you know, why is the sky blue? It would parse those, and then it can distribute that query to any number of search sites on the web, where get them all searching at once, and then when the results come back, it sorts them dynamically and puts them in one window for you. And Sherlock has a plugin architecture, so you can write plugins. Third parties have written plugins. There's over 200 plugins for Sherlock now, for searching almost anything. We immediately started getting questions like, well, could, Sherlock, could we group these categories of sites together? If you have to pick which sites you want to search out of a list of 200, it's kind of a long list. And other requests, all of those we have put into Sherlock 2, and then we've gone a giant leap further. Rather than Sherlock being just your internet search detective, we have taken it even further to where Sherlock 2 is now going to be your personal shopper on the internet and it's incredibly hot. We'll show it to you in just a minute. So that's number one. Number two, we've gotten a lot of customers saying, you know, I live in a house and there's 
four or five of us that use the same Mac, and you know, I, I don't want my kids looking at my files. I don't want my kids messing up my desktop. And, you know, I like to use a certain browser. They like to use another browser. I, I get tired of reconfiguring the machine every time I come back. I have certain preferences set. They have others. Mac OS 9 handles this completely automatically. You can set Mac OS 9 up to where you can log in. And once you log in, your desktop appears. Your files are secure from anyone else unless you volunteer to share them. All of your preferences are set for you. The browser you like, the home page you like, just everything. And it's all automatic. Now, since you need a password, whether, it's in a, whether you're in a college dorm or whether you're at home or in a business, since you need a password, why not be able to use your voice? We have built in voice print passwording to Mac OS 9. Your voice is your password. On the internet, on the internet though, you know, one password doesn't get you very far, right? On the internet, you need a password for everything, it seems like. And, you know, to get into this server, to get into this service, passwords, they're like keys and they're falling out of our pocket. Well, what do we need? We need a keychain. We need a place to put all these keys so that when we unlock the keychain with our master password, it unlocks them all. And we don't have to deal with all those other passwords completely built in to Mac OS 9, a feature called the keychain. Next one, auto-updating. We like to come out with updates to our OS to make it even better, to add refinements to it between major releases, to fix drivers, as an example, from some of our third parties and ourselves. And we have added a feature now to Mac OS 9 where the OS can keep you up to date every single day if you want, so that you're always running the latest and greatest version of the OS, again, all automatically. Six, encryption. When you want to send files over the internet, you don't want just anybody to read them. We have built in full encryption into Mac OS 9, so you can take a file, encrypt it, decrypt it, send it over the internet using very powerful encryption technology, all built into OS 9. File sharing over the internet. As you know, Mac has file sharing now within a local work group, really powerful file sharing. Now, completely extended onto the internet, there are no boundaries. You can share files over the internet exactly the same way that you share files in a local area network. This is a biggie. For those of you that use AppleScript to automate publishing workflows, it's incredible what you can do you know, in a local area network with multiple machines co coordinated through AppleScript. But what do you do if your service bureau is in New York? Well, you go out and buy OS 9 is what you do. Because now, those same things you can do on your local area network with AppleScript, you can do over the internet in a secure fashion with AppleScript built into OS 9. And lastly, a way to find some of those services out there, we built in a network browser so that you can find servers on the internet as easily as you can use a printer, as easily as you can use a printer browser to find printers on your local area network, all built into OS 9. And these are just nine of the over 50 features that we've got. And what we'd like to do now is show you a few of them. Phil? Hi again, Steve. We have here uh, Mac OS 9 running on a Power Mac. And I'd like to show you just briefly uh, three of the features that Steve introduced you to uh, with Mac OS 9. First one, of course, is we're sitting here with multi-user log on and we can choose to log on with our voice or with a password, whichever we choose. Steve told you voice, your voice is your password. Now I have a demo in here I want to do. It's actually not in my area, it's in Steve's log on area. So I'm going to log on to that. So let me just log into Steve's area and uh, use my voice to log in. My voice is my password. Huh. Can't get in as Steve. Let me try to say just how you might say. My voice is my password. So this is a demo that hasn't gone awry. This is a demo of exactly what's supposed to happen. I've used my voice, standard microphone built into Mac OS 9, and tried to log in as Steve. And of course, it's seeing that I'm not Steve. And it won't let me get into his area. So Steve, if I could borrow your voice for a moment and show us how it's supposed to work when you log in with the proper voice. 
My voice is my password. Thanks, Steve. So as Steve logs in, it brings up his desktop, his application, his files, his preferences, unlocks anything he set up in his keychain to automatically unlock, all done with the simple power of using his voice. Now let me show you a second feature, and the most powerful one of all, Sherlock. As Steve told you we've got the new Sherlock 2 that will be coming in Mac OS 9, and it takes Sherlock far beyond what we delivered with Mac OS 8.5. Now many of you probably are already using Sherlock in Mac OS 8.5, and you know just how it works. For those who haven't used it yet, I'll show you briefly how it works today. I can type in a, la a natural, natural request. Many of you know that it's the 30th anniversary of the Apollo uh, landing on the moon, Apollo 11 first landing on the moon, something I'm very interested in. Well, I'm going to type in that, that request. So I'm going to find information on the internet about the Apollo 11 mission. I have, right down here in the window, a whole bunch of plugins for search engines, popular search engines around the web. I've selected AltaVista, Excite, InfoSeek, down below Lycos, and when I hit search, Sherlock sends that request out to all those search engines and starts gathering the results back to me all in this window. They're, they all start appearing that fast, real time over the internet, with all those search engines ranked by relevance to my request. So I don't have to go to all the different search sites. It comes right up here on top. I can scroll through by single click on one of them, going to tell me a short brief description right there. If I double click, it launches my browser and brings me right to that web page with that page that I was searching for. I don't have to go through another engine, past the home page. I go straight to the information I want. Now this is what millions of people are now using today, Sherlock, to find information on the internet. But with Sherlock 2, we've created these channels along the top. And these channels allow you to search for different kinds of information. For example, I can search for people across industry standard LDAP servers on the internet. I can search for news from news sites. I've selected CNET and CNN. Let's click search again, same search. Only now, instead of just generic information, I'm finding news about the Apollo 11 mission. It comes back, not only does it give it the name and the relevance, the ranking, but it will also give us the date, because it's news, and I want to know what's the latest news. Let's pick one right here. Oh, Paul 11 experiments. Double click, launch my browser, right to the news page. It tells us, sure enough, a Paul 11 experiments are still returning results. Right to the news, all in seconds. Not having to work through all different search engines. But most powerful of all is the ability to have different shopping or e-commerce sites built into Sherlock 2. If I click my shopping basket, I see a few examples of these. Well, let's turn on Amazon Books, Music, Video, and Barnes and & Noble. And this time, let's look for anything, books, music, videos, that have to do with Apollo 11. Again, Sherlock sends out my request to the e-commerce sites and instantly starts getting back a list of things that meet the requirement of Apollo 11. I can now sort it by name, by price, by availability, it tells me what I can buy, when I can buy it, and how much it'll cost. It's never been any, any easier to find this stuff. Sort by name, Paul 11 mission reports. Here's one from NASA, a mission report. Double click it, takes me right to Amazon.com, right to the page to purchase that book, and I can just put it in my shopping cart, order it, and go. So it's so easy to find e-commerce sites and buy goods or services. Let's do one more, shopping for Apollo 11. This time, I'm going to turn on Amazon Auctions and eBay, two very different auction sites. I'm going to click Search, and now I'm going to find collectibles, not books or videos, but collectibles out there on the internet. Again, it comes back right away from those sites, gives me the price, the availability. Let's look by price. That's the cheapest thing I can buy, I'm a pretty cheap guy, Apollo 11. Right here, I can buy a 1969 National Geographic print from back when the Apollo mission landed on the moon. There it is. If I wanted to go get that book, I can go get it for 99 cents on eBay. Let's look at the other end of the spectrum. What's the most expensive stuff I can buy? Uh, 650, that's a little high for me. Uh, here's one, Apollo 11 uh, photo signed by Buzz Aldrin for $150. The auction is still up for five days. 
I double click, I go right to that page, and there's the photo signed by Buzz Aldrin. I can enter my, uh, my bid on this and keep, come back and keep tracking to see whether I'm the highest bidder. So that's Sherlock 2. It's going to make it really easy for people to not only find information on the internet, find people and news, but to make it extremely easy to shop for any goods or services you want on the internet, all from one Mac, Mac OS standard interface. I have one more demo I'd like to do. Since we're here at Seabold, publishing show, a lot of our best and biggest customers here, I thought we'd show you some of the power of the new Apple Script inside Mac OS 9. As Steve told you, Apple Script can now run over TCP IP. So any computer on the internet can be involved in your workflow. Well, last year we stood here and showed you Apple Script running native, PowerPC, native code, five times faster than Mac OS 8.5. And millions of customers are using that to automate their workflow. And in our demonstration, we had the one button I had to click. And on my computer, I completely automated making a brochure right there on the screen. And it did all the work for me. Well, now, as you can see, we have two screens up here. The computer on the left is my home computer here in San Francisco. Pretty picture of the Golden Gate Bridge. Makes it easy to know right there, the left, San Francisco. On the right, I have another machine representing perhaps my service bureau in New York. Beautiful picture of the Brooklyn Bridge there. And the only thing connecting these two computers is an internet connection. There is nothing else connecting these computers. They have a TCP IP address on the internet. But we've set up a secure connection inside AppleScript using the new keychain feature of Mac OS 9. So what I'm going to do to create a brochure, I'm going to open up FileMaker. I'm going to create a brochure from a database of information something a lot of our customers do, database-driven publishing. I'm going to click a button right here to launch my script, and that's all I have to do, and the computer will do the rest. It launches Adobe's InDesign. It opens up the template to create my brochure, and now it starts talking to the computer in New York, and it's saying, I need images for my brochure. The computer in San Francisco is laying out the text, laying out the document on its own, and requesting images from a database on the computer on the right that computer on the right is not only serving up those images, but cropping and resizing them for the size requested by launching Photoshop and using Photoshop on its machine. And the power of this is incredibly obvious. To write one script that automates a workflow across multiple computers around the internet with a secure keychain key communications. We're almost done. Two more images to go. Again, they're working in parallel. The one on the left doesn't have to wait for the run on the right. One more image to go. And we're done. So that's really giving new meaning to the term internet publishing. The ability to create publishing documents across the internet using the power of AppleScript and Mac OS 9. Thank you very much. That's good. So we think OS 9 is going to be an incredibly great release, and we encourage you all to buy it when it comes out this October. It's your internet co-pilot. It's going to sell for $99. Take a look at it. It's very, very strong. We've worked very, very hard on it. And this brings us to our systems products. Now, as you know, we have a strategy have a very simple product line and have great products in all four of these quadrants. A pro desktop and portable, a consumer desktop and portable. And at Macworld last month, when we introduced our iBook, it's been the first time we filled in all quadrants of this matrix. And we're really excited about that and we're firing on all cylinders now. So I'd like to review these with you briefly. First one is the iMac. As you know, the iMac, we came out with the colored iMacs. Our code name was Lifesavers in January. They took off like a rocket, and they've been incredibly strong ever since. And iMac was one year old two weeks ago. Unbelievable. <laughs> Seems like a lot longer to me. And uh, a lot's happened in that year. We sold two million iMacs in that year. And in North America, 90% of the iMac owners are on the internet. That's off the charts. 
So they're clearly using this you know, as their primary internet access device. And a third of these buyers are first-time computer owners. This is tremendous, not only for them, but for Apple. <laughs> Another thing that's happened in the last year is with iMac, we pioneered universal serial bus. This was something that had been invented a while ago and was really not going anywhere. And we got behind it because we thought it was the future of all personal computing and built it into the iMac. And the results have been staggering. Uh, we now have over 125 shipping USB devices with double that announced. And it's taken off like a rocket. And the Wintel world is now trying to catch up. It's clear that this is going to be the universal standard for medium speed peripherals in the entire industry, with Apple leading the way. And a few great new USB devices you may want to check out in the booth. NEC has got this cute little portable scanner. And one of the neat things about USB, of course, is you can hot plug it in and out while the power's on without re restarting the computer, without having to load drivers. And it also supplies power. So the scanner, as an example, is powered right off the USB bus. Another cool one that we're finally starting to see is the multifunction printers. There's two from Epson and one from Canon and more on the way. They do faxing, scanning, printing, all off of USB. So USB has been a, a huge success. Another thing that's gone through the roof in the last year is the number of new and renewed Macintosh applications. We watch this very carefully because this is the barometer of how well we are attracting and retaining our core developers, one of the most important constituents to Apple and obviously to our customers. And it's gone through the roof. 4,380 new and renewed Mac apps in the last year. And they're obviously too numerous to show them to you here today. So I picked out one that I thought you might want to see. Uh, IBM announced their Via Voice technology last month for the Macintosh, and it's my pleasure to invite Ozzy Osbourne, the general manager of IBM Speech Systems Division, up here to give us a demo. Ozzy? Thank you, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here again. It's uh, really exciting to bring our Via Voice dictation product to the Macintosh. We're really taking two easy-to-use products, bringing them together, and giving you more power. Last month at uh, Macworld in New York, we announced it, and I have been getting cards and letters, emails. It's been a great success. But instead of telling you how to do it, I think the best thing to do here is to show you. So I'm going to have Jeff Kuznet join me. He's down from our Almaden uh, Center, down in Almaden uh, Research Center. Let him do the demo. And so, Jeff, it's all yours. Hi, I'm Alice Cooper. And here. <laughs> Here to give you a brief demonstration of Via Voice on uh, Macintosh, of course. <laughs> Dear readers, colon, new paragraph. You live and you learn, exclamation point. I drove all the way to San Francisco for an exclusive interview with Ozzy, comma, but I got here and I found the wrong Ozzy, period. No bats or chickens, comma, but this one was even more bizarre, period. He talks to computers, exclamation point. And what's truly outrageous, comma, they actually listen to him, exclamation point. Sorry I won't have a music column for you this month, comma, but I think we're on to something even bigger, period. Transfer to Microsoft Word. And we're done. amazing. It's really exciting to be on the Mac platform. Uh, if you want to see more, we're in the Apple booth. Uh, we're easy to find. If it's anything like Macworld, we're about 10 or 12 deep. So come join us, and we look forward to being on the Mac platform. Thanks, Steve. Two years ago, nobody would listen to us. Now we got our computers listening to us. It's great. Okay, so 4,380 new and renewed Mac apps in the last year since iMac was introduced. And those are some of the over 15,000 products now available for Macintosh. You can go to the Apple website and look in the Macintosh product guide and peruse to your heart's content. It's August 15th, one year anniversary. So that's an update on iMac. Next, I'd like to fill you in on iBook uh, if you haven't heard about it. Um, it is a whole new category 
of personal computer. It's saying, let's not take our 18-month or two-year-old stale technology from the business portable world and sell it or try to sell it to consumers. Let's not do that. Let's design a product specifically for the consumer and education market for those customers that want a great portable using the best state-of-the-art technology that that price range can afford. And that's what iBook is. In essence, whoops, excuse me. In essence, it's iMac to go. And that was our design goal for this product. And it came out just beautifully. Um, you can see them out in the booth, but it's something like you've never seen before. It includes a feature that almost no portable's ever had called a handle. And <laughs> it's really great. Now, we think the most important part of a portable is actually, or any computer really, is, is in some ways it's display. And the display on the new iBook is beautiful. It's incredibly nice. It's a 12-inch TFT display. Really beautiful display. And it has 800 by 600 dots, millions of colors. We're driving it with an ATI Rage mobility chip. For those of you who are familiar with that, it's blazingly fast. Matter of fact, uh, the graphics on this thing are just outshine almost everything in the market. And we're powering this thing with a 300 megahertz G3 processor. This machine is faster than the fastest computer Apple shipped a year ago at any price. And it is the fastest portable in the world, including all the Wintel portables at five and $6,000, except for one, and that's our own PowerBook. <clears throat> we built in a CD-ROM drive, some memory, a disk drive, and we built in the I.O. that you need, a 56K modem, 10 100 Ethernet and USB all built into the product, a full-size keyboard, and six-hour battery life. Six-hour battery life so that you can take this thing to campus and back without having to bring a charger or an extra battery. You know, you can take this on a transcontinental flight without taking an extra battery or a charger. It's a big deal. All-day battery life. And we're selling this for $1,599, complete. They're available in mid-September, so in a few weeks, we're starting to ship these things. And it's looking really good. And we have already received over 140,000 orders for these things. And this number of orders does not include Japan. We have not even started taking orders in Japan uh, one of the strongest portable markets in the world. So we're very, very excited about iBook. And we've got some great TV ads we're going to be running later this month. If you'd like, I'll show them to you. You want to see them? Yeah? Daar maken we er niet helemaal een uh, commercial van. Even het commentaar. Die nieuwe G4 van Apple is natuurlijk wel weer wat sneller en wat beter. En dat laat Steve Jobs ook allemaal weten. Maar feitelijk blijft het concept van de Apple natuurlijk hetzelfde. Het is een heel handzame computer, gebruiksvriendelijk... en met steeds meer de neiging om gebruikt te gaan worden... voor het maken van video en televisie. Video heeft de toekomst, dat is duidelijk... en daar heeft Apple goed op ingespeeld. Maar dat het echt van die wonderdingen zijn... daar kunnen we ook wel een beetje aan twijfelen. Anders zou het marktaandeel wel veel groter zijn. Apple verkoopt goed, bestaat weer, het draait weer... maar... Het grootste aantal computers in de wereld wordt nog steeds verkocht met Intel processoren en het Windows operating systeem. Dus you know, you see there is more to this world than megahertz and megabytes, isn't there? Okay. Now another amazing thing that we introduced first as the companion to the iBook is our amazing airport wireless networking technology. This stuff is beautiful. It's a wireless local area network. It runs at 11 megabits per second throughput. It's industry standard all the way, IEEE 802.11. So not only us, but a lot of other companies are now announcing and beginning to make products for the standard. It offers privacy for data with 40-bit encryption. And we developed it with Lucent, who's got the best technology for this type of stuff, combined with the stuff we were doing internally, has produced a dynamite solution. Now, you start with an airport base station. And the airport base station looks like this on the back, and it's got two data ports on it. One, it's got a 56K modem built in it, so you can just plug it right into any phone line. 
or it's got a 10 megabit per second Ethernet port in it, so you can plug it in to any terrestrial network, or you can plug it into any DSL modem or cable modem. Once you do that, it takes that and converts it into the wireless network. And it's $299. And up to 10 users can share one of these things. There's other versions that will cost a little more. It will take you up to 50 users if you want. And you can roam between these things. And then there's the airport card. One of these airport cards slips right into the iBook inside. And there's antennas built in every single iBook. It's wireless ready right from the factory. You just lift open the keyboard like you'd add more memory. You slip in this little card, put on the antenna cable, put back the keyboard, and boom, all the software recognizes it immediately, transparently. Boom, you're wireless. You don't have an hour of setup to do. It's all integrated right into the software. And the airport cards cost $99. And so we can have up to 10 iBooks sharing one of these airport base stations, and they can be up to 150 feet away. That's half a football field. Half a football field, and of course you can have multiple access points, multiple base stations. So we're really, really excited about this. We're so excited that we do what we do when we get really excited. We made a television commercial. <laughs> so I'd love to run that for you too. We have fun too. So that's airport and that completes the iBook story. And again, we're just super excited about this, not only as a product, but as a whole new category of product that nobody's ever served before. And of course, we have our power books. These are amazing products, and we just introduced our latest revision of the power book in May. It's brand new, and we've been making a lot of them, but I apologize, we haven't been able to keep up with demand. This product is very strong in the marketplace for us right now, and partly because it's the fastest portable ever made. It's incredibly fast. It's also under six pounds, and it has up to a five-hour battery life on one battery, and it accepts two batteries. So you can get up to 10 hours of battery life on this thing, and it is the best way to watch movies on an airplane ever invented. <coughs> and so we're doing as best we can to catch up with demand on this. We're shipping a lot of them, and if you have a chance to get one, they are the best portable in the world. Which brings us to our pro desktop. We've got some fun news for you today here. We introduced what's called our blue and white G3 this last January, and it's based on the PowerPC G3 chip that we brought to market almost two years ago. It is regarded as the fastest desktop personal computer in the business. We'd like to make it better. What do we do to top the venerable G3? We're going to give you something even faster. We're going to give you one of these. <laughs> it's a supercomputer. You laugh. You say, well, why do mere mortals need a supercomputer? <laughs> what are you talking about? Steve's gone loopy. Well, it turns out you actually need one now. Because Photoshop filters are now resembling the most sophisticated image processing that NASA does. Internet security is demanding CIA strength algorithms. And encoding digital media is something that used to happen quickly. Now you might as well go out to lunch while it's happening. And these kinds of tasks now are really slowing us down. These kinds of tasks are basically bringing today's personal computers to their knees. And yet they're precisely what supercomputers were invented to do really fast. Precisely. And we're doing them every day now, only we're not doing them really fast. So what is it that makes a supercomputer super? What precisely is it? It's this. A supercomputer can execute over one billion floating point operations per second. A billion. That's a lot. It's a staggering measure of performance that's known as a gigaflop. Giga as in billion, flop as in floating point operation. A billion floating point operations per second. 
Now, let me give you some examples of why you might need that. Take a Photoshop filter on a 2K by 2K image, okay? You got 4 million pixels on the image. A very simple Photoshop filter is going to take you 400 operations per pixel. It could be many times that. That's 1.6 gigaflops to do that operation in one second. You might have 10 filters you want to run on that image, and you might have 30 images you need to run it on four times a week. You can see how this adds up. Quick time encoding. We got 30 frames per second. A 640 by 480 image is 300,000 pixels per frame. We've got 200 operations per pixel to encode it. That's 1.8 gigaflops to do this in real time. This is the kind of stuff we want to do. This is the kind of stuff we are doing, except we're doing it slowly. So we think gigaflops are going to become a very popular thing in the near future. And this is how to get them. Who can afford their very own supercomputer? Right? How many of you have a supercomputer? Not many. But that's all going to change. Because today, we're announcing the new PowerPC G4 chip. This thing is incredible. It's the first supercomputer on a chip. It delivers a sustained performance. Well, before I get to that, actually, it has been architected by Apple, Motorola, and IBM. And it delivers a sustained performance of over one gigaflop. Sustained. And it has a peak performance of four gigaflops. It's unbelievable. And we think this thing is going to set the industry on fire. So what makes it so fast? Well, if you look at a traditional processor, oh, it's something we call the velocity engine. The velocity engine is a supercomputer that's been miniaturized onto a sliver of silicon and is a part of every G4 processor chip. Right? The velocity engine. And what is that? Well, if you look at a traditional processor, you've, the high end, you've got three types of instruction units. One that calculates branches, one that does integer arithmetic, and one that does floating point arithmetic. The G4 adds a fourth called the velocity engine. But it's unlike any of the first three. The first three are 32 bits, or in some cases 64 bits of information at once. The velocity engine's a 128-bit instruction unit, right? So this thing processes two to four times the amount of data at once as traditional processors do. But the most amazing thing is this thing can do four 32-bit floating point operations in one cycle. That's two to four times faster than anything our industry has ever seen before. And so what does that mean? Well, if you're doing four instructions per cycle and you're running at 500 million cycles per second, which is what megahertz means, that's two gigaflops. Now, the velocity engine in some cases can actually do eight instructions in one cycle to get to the theoretical peak of four gigaflops. We've never seen this in a single piece of silicon before, the G4. Now, how does this stack up against Intel's brand new third generation processor, their Pentium 3? Well, we thought one of the best ways to measure it would be to go ask Intel. And so we did. We went to their website. And what we found was that Intel had written some tests for the Pentium 3 and published them right on their website. And we were able to run those exact same tests, Intel's very own tests on the G4. And let me show you the results. The G4 was 2.9 times faster than the Pentium 3 running Intel's own tests. That's what we're talking about here. So we're very excited about this. Now, this high velocity chip deserves a high velocity computer. And so we're going to be shipping the G4 in 400, 450, and 500 megahertz versions all have a one megabyte L2 cache. And there'll be a few different models. The high-end models will also include some other features. Like 
Ja, we komen een beetje aan het eind van de tijd die we hebben voor Steve Jobs. Je moet goed, moet goed begrijpen, dit is een heel commercieel verhaal. Dit is een lezing op een Siebold conferentie gehouden voor mensen die Apple dealers zijn, Apple kopers, Apple gebruikers. Het is een beetje preken voor eigen progie. Maar het geeft wel een aardige indruk van de ontwikkelingen. En de problemen die er zijn om te kiezen tussen de snelste chips. Want aan de andere kant zegt Intel natuurlijk ook dat ze fantastische chips hebben. Intel heeft wat problemen de laatste tijd met haar chips. Er gaan allerlei dingen fout. En daar profiteert Apple dus van. Apple is een heel handige computer, een heel gebruiksvriendelijke computer. En heeft voor bepaalde toepassingen zoals video echt wel voordelen. Aan de andere kant, een beetje relativeren mag. Dit is Steve Jobs die voor zijn eigen portemonnee staat te praten. Maar we vonden het leuk om het te laten horen, want zo'n uitgebreide uitleg over wat de computertechnologie eigenlijk betekent en waar het naartoe gaat, is toch wel leuk.